the theme from the Sears Radio Theater. Tonight, a program of mystery with Vincent Price as your host. The Sears Radio Theater will begin... This is Vincent Price. We have all been subject to fear. There is fear from within and fear that comes from the external. Fear consumes and dictates. There are times when fear is very real. There are times when fear has no basis. If you take off her shoe, you'll find a cloven hoof. You talk like we're living in the dark ages. The girl is evil. She will bring destruction down upon all of us. No one will deny that fear is not elusive. Fear clings so closely you cannot see around it. Melissa Baker is a subject of fear. Melissa lives with her mother, Grace Ann Baker. Melissa's father died in a hotel fire one week before she was born. The tragedy happened in Morristown, New Jersey. A week later, Grace Ann took her daughter to a small sea resort in California. It was winter. There were no tourists, only the year-round natives. Because of Melissa, this community was divided into two factions, torn by fear, living in apprehension, frightened not by a supernatural monster or a shark, but by Melissa, a 14-year-old. And that's only the beginning of our story. A new adventure in radio listening. Five nights of exceptional entertainment every week. Brought to you in Elliot Lewis production of The Sears Radio Theater. Our story, Melissa, by Barney Gerard. Our stars, Ruthie Taylor, Mary Jane Croft, and True Boardman. <laughs> Something about the ocean and the seashore which many claim is beneficial to a person's health and general sense of well-being. The sea air acts as a tonic, it said, reviving a person, filling body and mind with good health. With this foreknowledge, Melissa, age 14, and her mother, in her 50s, left the tragedy of the father's death in the hotel fire behind them and moved to a sea resort on the west coast hoping to find some happiness. But life plays tricks. What seems to be wrong is often right. And what appears to be normal is often wicked. Melissa, without guile, quietly pursues her life. But in some eyes, it's not a normal life. Not a life in which everything falls exactly into place in an easily recognizable and understandable way. And so, while a small seacoast town might, on the surface, appear to be a haven of peace and security, the very opposite, under certain circumstances, might turn out to be true. I'll be right there. Forgive me for keeping you waiting. My credentials, ma'am. Oh, uh, I don't have my glasses. Uh, Lieutenant Harley Brown, I'm from the city attorney's office. Uh, are you Mrs. Baker? Yes. Well, it's regarding your daughter, Melissa. May I come in? Oh, Melissa. Yeah, uh, come in, come in. Well, tell me what this is about. Thank you. Oh, please sit down first. Thank oh, you. but not here. Melissa's taking a nap. Our voices travel up the stairway. In here, please. Mm -hmm. Didn't go to bed till five this morning. I hate to see you work such long hours. Sit down. I'll shut the door. Huh. Tea? Coffee? Something cold? Uh, no, thank you, ma'am. Uh... This is quite a library. Melissa spends most of her time here. About all I ever do in here is dust. Do you mind if we sit by the window? I find watching the ocean so restful. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, that was a police badge you showed me. Uh, yes, Mrs. Baker. I'm an investigator with the city attorney's office. I understand. What's that got to do with Melissa? Well, she's part of it, of course, but the complaint is directed at you, Mrs. Baker. After all, Melissa is a minor. I see. I see. Yes, I, I think I know why you're here. But go on. Uh, you purchased this house? Yes. So I can assume you are a permanent resident? Yes. You're not here for a vacation? No. I'm advised that you moved into the house in June. True. 
Uh, Melissa is not enrolled in any private school. Of course not. Melissa is 14 years old. 14. Well, our public schools open September the 15th. Melissa is in the Washington Junior High District. Now, Mrs. Baker, this is the middle of January, and I am advised that as of this date... Melissa has not been enrolled in school. You're absolutely right. Melissa is not attending Washington Junior High or any other school. Credited private tutors, then? Would you settle for Albert Einstein or Charles Dickens? Maybe William Butler Yeats or Richard Wagner? And we must not overlook Friedrich Nietzsche or Thomas Alva Edison. No, we won't overlook them, Mrs. Baker. She will be exposed to all of them the day she starts school. You do not understand. There is nothing your schools can offer, Melissa. Well, I'm not here to discuss the merits of our school system. I'm not singling out our town, Lieutenant. Any school in any part of the world. Uh, you are in our town, Mrs. Baker, and we do not ignore the law. I know the law. So please don't bother to quote it. This is not a case involving truancy. No, the charge will be much stronger, Mrs. Baker. You failed to register, Melissa. I know, I know. Lieutenant, listen to me. No, better yet, you can listen to Melissa. I hear her coming downstairs. Melissa? I'm in the library. What time is it? Nearly five. Come in, Melissa. There's a gentleman here wants to meet you. Lieutenant Brown, this is my daughter, Melissa. I'm pleased to meet you. Thank you. Melissa, you have been influenced by many great educators. I know you have your favorites. And I'm sure Mr. Brown would be interested. Oh, well, uh, I'd have to start with John Dewey. He taught me that knowledge is not based upon obtuse and preconceived ideas. He made me conscious that thought as well as matter is a dynamic process, that logic is a developing discipline, and that philosophy is not an accumulation of abstractions originating in pure objectivity, but has a social force. Um, Mr. Dewey wanted me to have confidence, and he introduced me to Mr. Emerson. I'm sure you're familiar with Mr. Emerson's line, if a man plants himself indomitably on his instincts, the world will come round to him. But there is the other side of the coin. Mr. Edison keeps reminding me that genius is 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration. Um, from Mr. Gandhi, I learned self-discipline. Mr. Churchill always reminds me that a fanatic is one who can't change his mind and won't change the subject. I learned mathematics from Mr. Einstein, but he also made me aware that the most beautiful thing we can experience is the mysterious. It's the source of all true art and science. Uh, it is very impressive, sir, to read so much at your age. Oh, we talk, too. I think I learn more from the discussions. Who does she talk to, Mrs. Baker? William Shakespeare, for one. I haven't talked to him in months. He's busy writing a new play. I see. I don't think Lieutenant Brown understands Melissa, and he is getting very uncomfortable. Well, it's not a question of understanding, Mrs. Baker. I mean, uh, are you asking me to believe that Albert Einstein teaches your child math? Mr. Einstein usually comes late in the evening. He's very kind and patient with me. Huh? We don't always meet here. He likes to walk. So does Mr. Beethoven. Uh-huh. There's no need to be frightened, Lieutenant oh. Brown. I'm, I'm not the least. You certainly give that impression. Well, I'll have to turn in a report. Are you sure you want it to remain this way? Are you suggesting that my daughter and I, because of your report, should be dishonest? Make a false statement, like Melissa does not go to school because she's anemic? Now, you know that is not what I intended. There is a very simple solution, Lieutenant Brown. Melissa can be tested on any level, college, postgraduate, whatever your authority chooses. Now, if you will allow me, Lieutenant Brown, I will lead you to the front door. Yes. Lieutenant Brown's report on Melissa Baker raised the question of whether Melissa should be examined by a scholar or a psychiatrist or both. At this point, Melissa was merely a curiosity not to be taken too seriously, and to be treated in a routine fashion without any notoriety. A date was set for a hearing before formal charges would be implemented. Melissa and her mother seemed to have no concern over the intrusion on their lives. Melissa made her daily trips to the park. Melissa, I, I was looking for you. Oh, I'm sorry, Ellen. I had to go to the store for my mother. I want you to meet two of my friends. This is Joan Felton and Nora Minkin. Hi, I'm very pleased to meet you. 
Ellen has told us so much about you. Was that a true story you told Ellen yesterday? Ethan Foam, wasn't it, Melissa? Oh, it was a novel by Edith Wharton. Well, why don't we sit down here? The grass is dry. I know what's in that bag, I hope. <laughs> That's how I bribe her. French fries and ketchup. <laughs> well, who did you talk to last night, Ellen? John Dewey. I'll get the coke, but don't start anything till I get back. Dig in. I envy you not having to go to school. No, oh, I don't know. The hearing's next week. It's so stupid. Oh, there's Tom. Tom, over here. I'm coming. Melissa, you're not worried about the hearing. I, I wouldn't ask you, but you seem down. I'm not down. Just thoughtful. I'm sure whatever test they lay on you will be a breeze. They'll have to give you a stack of diplomas. Then you can forget it. I'm not concerned. Move over. Make the news. Hey, I need some help, Melissa. They were out of touch. What did you get? Not orange. Oh, oh no. no. Okay, how can I help you, Tom? Well, Mr. Wheeler, I hate his class. He gives you a list of questions. It takes forever to find out the answer. And none of it is really that important. Now, listen to this. What was Voltaire's real name? Did he ever tell you? Yeah, he told me it was Francois-Marie Arouet. Um, who has a pencil? We want to hear a story. Well, one more question. Don Quixote. Was it published in one part or two? Cervantes told me it was in two parts. The first in 1605 and the second in 1615. Tell us about Ethan Fromm. I'd like to hear it again, if you don't mind. Well, I don't mind. It's a tragic story. And it's also very romantic and beautiful. <laughs> I'll put you through to his office. You're welcome. And take the switchboard. I have someone at the counter. Can I help you? Uh, yes, ma'am. I'm Lieutenant Holly Brown. I have an appointment with a David Carn. Room 12-2, right down that hall. Yeah. Could, could you tell me Mr. Carn's status? He's one of the assistant examiners. Yeah, thank you. my report, Mr. Korn. I don't know what further help I could be. I felt a preliminary hearing was of necessity. The vice principal of the high school, Grover Minkin, has a reputation for being well-versed in the arts and the humanities. Now, if Melissa Baker has this knowledge, then how deep is it? Or better yet, does he have a photographic mind, uh, read fast, skims over chapter heads? Now, this is what Minkin will pursue. I'm sure you can be of help to him. Well, I'm afraid that's not my department. All we ask is your cooperation. You spent time with the girl. You can be helpful. Well, I only saw her once. Eh? It wasn't for very long. I'll be candid, Lieutenant. Your report left a great deal to be desired. For example, here. Melissa Baker stated that Einstein did not always sit in her library. There were times when he preferred to walk, etc., etc. Et well, you don't need me to read the rest back to mm -hmm. you. But there is nothing here to indicate her personality faults, her, her abnormal behavior. Uh, my job is to establish the evidence. Has the law been broken? In this case, there was no doubt. They even admitted it. The rest is up to the prosecutor assigned. I know the due process of law, Lieutenant Brown. The city attorney's office has asked us to make a determination. That is why you are here. I don't know what more I can tell you. Uh, uh, how did she act? The girl? Yeah. And she, uh, she did make me feel strange. How? Uh, once I had the facts, all I wanted to do was get out of there. No, 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 no. I mean, uh, what what did she do that was strange? That well, was the way that she looked at me and talked. In what way? She sounded so sincere. <laughs> Theater will continue. Melissa's hearing was for four o'clock in the afternoon. The small meeting room in the school board was filled to capacity. This hearing is in order. 
My name is David Carr. You are, I'm sure, familiar with Principal Grover Menken. First, I want to address Grace Baker and her daughter, Melissa. Our purpose is to be informal. The members here are part of the county school system. Dr. Town is a psychologist. Helen Crone is on the board of adult education. Dr. Rand is a physicist on leave from the university. Mr. Menken will conduct the hearing. Mr. Menken? I, uh, I will address my questions to Melissa. Now, first, Melissa, Einstein's theory of relativity differed from Newton's. Can you tell me why? Yes. Mr. Einstein explained it to me one night. The paper you're referring to was translated in 1920, and it was called Relativity, the Special and General Theory. Now, that concept challenged physicists and mathematicians throughout the world. You see, Newton's followers were convinced that motion and rest were absolutely measurable. Mr. Einstein demonstrated that motion and rest are relative, measured differently by different observers. Then he proceeded to demolish the even more sacred absolutism of length, mass, and time, the three fundamental measures on which all other quantities depend. Explain to me Einstein's principle of equivalence. Oh, that principle asserts that there's no basic difference between the forces of gravity and acceleration. Oh. Tell me about Einstein. What does he look like? He must be very old by now. Well, uh, what happens is that you immediately sense the vibrancy in him. You're aware that he's constantly stimulated by new concepts. But when you sit across from him, how does he, how does he appear? I feel him. Feel him? Yes. Then you don't see him. I feel his presence in the room. But he talks to you. Yes. If I sat in the room with you, could I hear him? I don't know. My mother can't hear him, but I do. Yeah. Doesn't that seem odd to you, Melissa? No. I, I, I hear him from within. Within? Myself. Mr. Mankin, you remember Hamlet's speech to Horatio? Uh, if thou didst ever hold me in thy heart, absent thee from felicity a while, and in this harsh world draw thy breath in pain to tell my story. Please call my wife. Tell her I'm meeting privately with the staff and I'll be home late. Thank you. Oh, uh, Mr. Orchid in the city attorney's office called. He wants to know when he can expect to hear from you. Uh, yeah. If he calls back, tell him no earlier than the end of the week. Ah, uh, excuse the interruption. I turn back to you, Helen. I think it is ridiculous to dwell on her unbelievable wealth of knowledge. She covered Thackeray, Anatole France, Thorsten Veblen, Sun Yat-sen, Matisse, and Debussy, like she lived with them intimately. The question I pose is, did she? Oh, it's upsetting, I admit, Helen, but we have to keep this forum on a realistic level. If she is unreal, how do you account for it? Dr. Town is a psychologist. What do you say, Dr. Town? A psychic phenomenon, perhaps. We can turn to precedents, uh, other cases of this kind. There is no way to completely prove it scientifically. You would have to first start by accepting the concept. Hmm. Mr. Rand? Well, I don't have a mathematical equation for it. Mr. Megan, I have no doubts about Melissa Baker. Very obvious to me. What we witnessed here today is sorcery. Melissa is the devil's spawn. She's a damned spirit. The devil has sent her here to destroy us. I don't know about the devil, Mr. Mankin, but... But I will admit the supernatural is very perverse and alien to me. Do not underestimate the devil. He comes in many devious ways. Really, Mr. Mankin, I've heard enough of the abnormal... There is the, uh... in this girl the spirit of evil. I think we're all tired. Do we have to find a reason today? Now, why is an explanation necessary before Friday? I would like to spend some time with this girl. It, it's not fair. That's not the way to deal with satanic power. I understand how you feel, Mr. Mankin. There's no question of the... Well, the girl is eerie. She taxes my sense of credibility. She's so sure of herself, all, almost smug. I found myself becoming unsympathetic to her. I don't think it was smugness. I suspect she was frightened in spite of her show of positiveness. Heretical. What is our position? We're complicating matters. The question before us is quite simple. Is Grace Baker justified in not sending her daughter Melissa Baker to school? We cannot divorce ourselves from the source of that girl's knowledge. Can't we? I... Well, that's uh, a good point. Uh, if that's not an issue, then I... But it is. is. It is precisely the issue. 
I don't recall that we ever stopped teaching the difference between hell and heaven. I would refer to it as the positive and the negative. Oh, semantic. There are no semantics for profanity. I need a drink. I've got to make some statement tomorrow. I was supposed to meet my son for dinner. All right. I ask you to review the day. The girl was absolutely phenomenal. Uh, wait a minute. I'm referring to her scope of knowledge. Not one of us can deny it. How do you cope with someone who tells you Da Vinci comes to the house to teach her art? Is that any concern of ours? We are repeating ourselves. Well, all of you know where I stand. Is that the way you want it in the report? Definitely. Helen? I'm confused. Well, that wouldn't make us look good. Put it this way. I see no need for her to enroll in school. But I recommend that she undergo psychiatric examination. That is based on the fact that her behavior is not normal. Very good. Dr. Town, I am going to pass. On what grounds? Psychiatric examination takes time. Well, you must have some thoughts. Uh, I'll settle right now for something right off the top of your head. I get the impression, Dr. Town, you are avoiding the issue. You're the psychologist. I don't believe you sat through that hearing today without drawing some impressions. Well, there are explanations for Melissa's behavior if you believe in what is called paranormal. And if you accept the paranormal, it becomes normal. It is very possible that time and space do not apply to normal. Da Vinci's time is coexisting with Melissa's time. Past, present, and the future exist simultaneously. It is possible Melissa has a gift to communicate on that level. That is a lot of fancy nonsense. Mr. Mencken, it is obvious you believe in hell. You have no doubt in your mind that Satan has been able to possess Melissa. Then you must believe Satan has been able to transgress time and space. Who's denying the power of the devil? No more than you would deny the power of God or the existence of heaven. So I have to believe, Mr. Mencken, that you accept an afterlife in another sphere. Dr. Town, I am no fool. Now, don't you lead me by the hand. You make your point. I'm presenting another way to explain Melissa. I'm talking about the concept that we continue our lives after we leave this sphere. We are in the same universe, but we exist differently. Can we communicate between the two spheres? Melissa believes so. That kind of talk to me is profane. I could follow another line. If we are going to try and solve Melissa, we cannot measure her with a dogmatic ruler. I don't want a list of theories. I want an opinion. I don't think any of us is prepared to make the judgment you are asking. I want a conclusive report. You want an advancement. What did you say? You heard me. Give him a statement. I want to get out of here. I hear you. All right. Here is what you can quote. Don't deny Melissa Baker. Try to understand her. I'll accept it. Where do you stand? Are you directing that question to me? Very much so. I want to know exactly where you stand, Con. <laughs> I'm merely the interlocutor. You people are the experts. That does not satisfy me. I'll take a position. You can count on it. The meeting is over. I want written reports before 12 o'clock on Friday. Good night. I want to discuss the whole family hearing I sat in on set. Did you hear your father? Tom, Nora, now will you please? Your father's trying to talk to you. Sorry, Dad. I thought you were just waiting for Ben. Well, he had to pick up Lou and Ethel. And what about George? He'll be here. He's bringing the Thorntons with him. Everyone must be made aware. And I'm convinced after that hearing today, all we can count on for help are our friends. It's so hard for me to believe. I've met Melissa. You are now going to tell me that she's very kind and sweet? Well, she is. Nora, you know as well as I do, evilness can sometimes be very deceptive. When I first heard about her, I figured she was some kind of freak, but when you're with her, she just doesn't come off that way. That's exactly what I'm talking about. Well, couldn't we just ignore her, not go near her? That is not the way. I just wish it was someone besides Melissa. Oh. Yes. Who 
was it? I don't know. It was like the others. A man? A woman this time. What did she say? I was a demon. What else? We better get out of town before the sun sets. Oh, Dick. I keep asking myself, what have I done wrong? How have I offended these people? Sit down, Melissa. I want to talk to you. Now, let's begin with just you and me. We both know our relationship is not just a genetic one. I hope not. I know you tell the truth. I know you use your talent positively. You're thoughtful, generous in your desire to share. But those people out there don't know you like I do. The only thing they care to know is that I'm different. And they hate me for it. I'm satanic. I'm a freak. I'm a carnival performer with a photographic mind. I'm not Einstein or Voltaire, but I understand these people. Those great men who come to you will tell you the same thing. They have told me. I'm getting ahead of you. Oh, am I? That's not important. We'll only talk about what's important. But first, we must put it in its proper perspective. You with me? Yeah. We are not going to identify you as someone who is different. Is that clear? Yes. You are new. But that means you're different. Well, let's, um, let's do it another way. Okay, I'm listening. There's a prescription for everything. No one has your prescription. Okay. Oh, okay. Intellectually, I know you're right. But why can't I handle it emotionally? Don't focus on yourself. Focus on them. What prompts their reaction? Well, the, the panel that conducted the examination is a really good example. I felt each one of them was stuck inside his own dogmatic point of view, and not one of them would come out and even look around. That's the way they're programmed, Melissa. Think of them as computers. Unfortunately, what they have been fed can't accept someone like you as real. Do you, do you wonder about me sometimes? <laughs> of course. But I take pride in having an open mind. I see you as someone very advanced. Maybe one day we will all reach that sphere. It's coming from the front porch. Oh, get away from the window. There's a cross on the lawn. Oh, I see it. What is that printed on it? Next time it won't be firecrackers. I'm going to call the police. I hate the publicity that goes with it. We don't have a choice. Lieutenant Brown, I don't know if you remember me. Yes, of course. Uh, you remember my daughter, Melissa? Sure. Hello. Hello. Look, I've been asked to explain that there'll be an investigation. In the meantime, we feel you are too vulnerable if you stay in this house. Oh, we're not leaving. But I have to advise you that even if we take every precaution available, there's always the calculated risk. Now, we have a place you can stay in. No one, only those working close on the case will know the location. Hiding will not solve the problem. Well, a stand at this time might be foolish. We are not going to start running. I'm sure your daughter has a solution. That was unkind, officer. Yes, I, I apologize. All this talk, I'm sorry. I... It's okay. Well, how do you feel about just going away for a few days? Now, we've got a lead. I don't think it'll take long. No, I agree with my mother. Well, if that's your decision, we'll have to go along with it. I understand your position. But I don't think you're being fair to your neighbors. I hope they'll understand and be sympathetic. You'll be under 24-hour surveillance. Phones will be monitored. Oh, really? So much for so little. Excuse me, I'm going upstairs. What is that truck across the street? It's a TV crew. Uh, someone from the department will be close by. Now, all you have to do is pick up the receiver. I'm Al Mapes, KBEX. We'd like to tape an interview. But you'll have to talk to Mrs. Baker. Uh, I'll see you later. Uh, Mrs. Baker, could we speak with your daughter? I'll ask her. The officer, could we get a statement? Uh, may maybe later. Hurry up, Joe. It's going to get crowded in here. Will you set up on the lawn? Hey, you finished? Oh, boy, I just got here. Where's the girl? She's on her way. Yeah, she looks younger than 14. Uh, Melissa, I'm Al Mapes, KBEX News. Uh, Tom Mack from the Daily. Hello. Look, I've decided this is one way to prove I'm not possessed. Uh, would you mind moving out on the lawn? 
Uh, Mrs. Baker, would you join us? Certainly. Maybe I should pull back my hair so they can see I have no horns. Makes I'm going to make the afternoon edition. No problem. Uh, that's fine, Melissa. All right, Joe, roll it, please. Uh, Melissa, I understand you've been given 24 hours to leave town. Are you frightened? Yes. What do you think this is all based on? Ignorance. Well, after he the hearing, Mr. Mencken made the statement that your father burned in hell. I don't believe it. He cited a date. This is ridiculous. He... My husband died in a hotel fire in Morristown, New Jersey. But did you leave Morristown because you were under pressure, the kind you're receiving here? No. I was always treated kindly there. Well, why did you choose our town? <laughs> we wanted to live by the ocean. How would you explain yourself, Melissa? I consider myself very fortunate. Only because I know I'll be able to make a contribution so we can all live together without fear. <laughs> Excuse me, miss. Uh, will you tell Mr. Mencken that Lieutenant Brown is here? I can see you, Lieutenant. All right. In. Yeah. I've only got a few minutes. I don't mind getting to the point. If you've come to defend that girl, don't waste my time. Now, what I think doesn't matter personally. She's a wacko, as far as I can see, spaced out. But, well, that's her problem. It's yours, too. I'm not a religious man, so we'll keep me out of it. I'll pray for you. I'm only here because I have a job to do. The view of the department is that you are compounding the problem with your statements. Is that against the law? Inciting a riot is against the law. Just what are you trying to tell me, Lieutenant? Well, sir, the, the attitude of the department. Uh, believe me, we don't, we don't deny your point of view. Hmm. Only keep it to myself. Oh, we don't want to make it a public issue. That, that's not the way to deal with her. Uh, the next thing will be a flock of nuts over there siding in with her. Before you know it, they'll want to put up Einstein for mayor. Hey, why are you standing out on the porch? Waiting for you. I thought you'd never get home. Wait, what's wrong? It's Tom and Nora. They didn't come home. It's not that late. They took their sleeping bags with them. Oh? They say where they were going? That's what I'm trying to tell you. Oh, oh, here comes Mr. Carn. He drove over there to see what's going on. Oh, where? Nobody's making any sense today. To that girl's house, Melissa. Tom and Nora? Yes. The... They said they weren't coming back. You can't believe what's going on over there. My kids wouldn't even come out to talk to me. Now, now slow down. Now, tell me exactly what's happened. The kids. Now, there must be over a hundred of them, mostly from this neighborhood. Now, now they're coming from, from all over. Moved into that girl's house with their sleeping bags and gear. She is working a spell. They say they won't leave till they're sure the girl is safe. right into her hands? It wasn't her idea, Dad. We did this on our own. She even tried to talk us out of it. Uh, it's the spell. She's making you feel that way. Do you feel under a spell, Nora? No. I'm going back inside. Nora, you come back here. You've heard her, Dad. I've heard Nora. I feel the same way. Uh, oh, my God. What has this girl done to you? It's not Melissa, Dad. Why don't you come in? I'm giving you an order. You get Nora and come home. There's no devil inside. Nothing evil. The way you're acting tells me differently. I'm disappointed in you, Dad. In me? I haven't turned my back on my faith. Am I the one that is so weak as to become a groveling pawn? I'm disappointed in you because you didn't take time to try to know Melissa. She has blinded you. She's not going to harm anyone. Not even you, Dad. We know her. We find her a friend. Now, Tom, now, now listen to me. Divide and conquer. That's how they work. They're very clever. Can't you see that working now? It's the opposite of that. We want her to become one of us. Tom, I'm afraid for you. I'm afraid. That, that's why I've got to try to reason with you. You act as though she's 
gone out and shot someone. It's not much worse. Back where she's dragging you. Why do you fear her? Tell me one thing she has done. Son, Give me one example. Son, do you understand this power she practices? Is it a power? Yes. And satanic. But you have no proof of it. Maybe you can explain to me then what it is. Well, I don't know what it is. But I know it's not evil. Maybe one day I will understand it. Come home, Tom. Before it's too late. Dad, I want to ask you a question. Will you answer it honestly? I always do. Tell me, why is an onion? Why is an onion? Yes. Why is an onion? Uh, oh, Grover. Grover, I'm here. May I told you to stay home. Now, look, we could be doing wrong. Not me. Now, they have their right. Who? Tom and Nora. That has nothing to do with it. You know that. I'm, I'm not sure. May you... I'm going home. Oh. I'll stay. Excuse me, I'm Lieutenant Brown. Oh, yes, I, I remember. Uh, what do you think he'll do, your husband? He won't turn on Tom and Nora. I couldn't help but hear them talking. Yes, I heard them too. Why is an onion? Well, it, it is something to think about, isn't it? I guess so, if you're not afraid of one. was written by Barney Gerard, produced and directed by Elliot Lewis. Your host was Vincent Price. Our stars were Rusi Taylor, Mary Jane Croft, and True Boardman. Featured in the cast were Norman Alden, Gene Howell, Marvin Miller, Paula Winslow, Shepard Menken, Lee Millar, Gay Nelson, Gloria O'Brien, Stacy O'Brien, and Brian Miller. The music for Sears Radio Theater was composed and conducted by Nelson Riddle. This is Art Gilmore speaking. The Elliott Lewis production of Sears Radio Theater is a presentation of CBI.